So if you look at Romania's level of leverage, you've been through an enormous, of course, social change as well as economic, with going from the Ceausescu regime across to a a capitalist economy these days. And, of course, the huge inflation you had going from, what, uh, 14 later, the dollar to 30,000 and then all those conversions. Well, what was happening in the background behind that was a huge rate of deleveraging in private debt. And this is using data from your um, um, central bank. The ratio of private debt to GDP in Romania in 1990 was roughly 80% of GDP. It was quite high. Not as high as America. It's about half the level America had when its crisis struck, but a dramatic fall. Then you had an increase from 2000 to 2008 in the level of private debt. Then you flatlined at about 40% of GDP. Now you're falling. Now, this period here, I'm, I would have guessed from seeing that you had a boom, followed by a slump, okay? And it, it'll turn up in the data, as I'll show you in a moment. But to speak, speaking in general, your level of private debt is quite low. Um, I don't see any dangers in that level of private debt. Okay? It's when you get well beyond um, 60, 70, 80 percent, then you start having dilemmas caused by the level of private debt. But if you can manage the level of private debt, the level of lending, so it stays in that bounds, I think you'll have an economy that doesn't become dominated by financial speculation. Let's take a look at the, um, the, the change in debt and its contribution to the economy now. Now, you saw the correlation I showed you from the American data between the change in debt and the level of unemployment was enormous. It was about 0.93. This is actually a positive correlation. Only for this period here when you had the crisis, when there's a huge reduction in the rate of growth of debt and it goes negative for a while, that's when you had rising unemployment. Okay. So you've had fairly minor impact from the change of debt because your level of debt was so low. The second factor, though, is the acceleration of debt. And acceleration, when you look at the rate, the rate of change of GDP, the most volatile component of that is the acceleration of debt. So the acceleration of debt still plays a major role in your economy. And the correlation is about, I think, about minus 0.6 or 0.7. So you can see, again, you had this increase in unemployment occurring when you had a deceleration in debt. And then you had a recovery when that returned back again to acceleration once more. So if you include these indicators in your economic planning, you'll be able to see whether there's any forewarning of serious scale effects from the level of private debt and so on. And one important thing I need to emphasise, debt isn't necessarily bad. Okay? A capitalist economy, because it needs a growing amount of money, and because you can produce money in two ways in a capitalist system, you can either have the government running a deficit, or three, government running a deficit, private banks lending more than they get in repayments, or running a balance of trade surplus. Those are your three ways to create money inside an economy. Uh, generally speaking, in the economy needs a growing amount of money. So if you had the economy growing and private debt growing as well, with loans exceeding repayments, those loans finance a necessary part of expenditure in a capitalist economy. It's not bad to have rising level of debt. It's bad to have it rising faster than GDP for a substantial period of time. And then you have a crisis when you have to write that debt off to get out of the crisis effectively. Now, in, a, in an informal way, Romania wrote that debt off during that period from 1990 through to 2005 by the huge inflation you had at that time, which would have reduced the nominal value of debt quite substantially. Uh, so you, you've got yourself to actually a good situation, but you need now to be aware of the role that debt can play in the economy to avoid a future crisis. Good question. I have to come here, I collected some questions from the students. Okay. One is, what is the correlation between uh, US dollar and uh, Euro exchange rate <laughs> and the future price? Oh, I mean, um, the Euro is a catastrophe that should never have created. Okay. Creating it without a central bank, without, without, a, without a treasury to redistribute <laughs> surpluses so is... don't treasure Euros, huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, Yanis Varoufakis is quite right about why the crisis occurred and what should be done. Because forming the, Euro, the Euro European Union, uh, the, the Euro, without the Treasury was a huge mistake because they couldn't redistribute the surpluses that occurred in the system. Germany accumulates huge surpluses. Greece and the other southern European countries have, have huge deficits. They're financed by banks, which causes huge rises in the level of private debt 
or government debt of the governments have borrowed from banks, which they have to do under the Maastricht Treaty terms that they have a deficit greater than 3% of GDP, ultimately the crisis has to occur. Now, the only way around that is to redistribute those surpluses from the national level of, in international, in the, in the, the continental level of Europe between surplus and deficit nations, which is what happens in America. As Giannis has said many times, nobody knows nor cares what the trade deficit Alabama has with, with California. Okay? It's irrelevant. Vastly different economies. Tennessee is probably a better example. Tennessee economy versus California. Huge differences. Obviously, there's trade differences, financial flow differences, surpluses in, in, in capital flows and, and differences in commodity flows and labour payments and so on. Nobody even knows what they are. He said the same thing should apply at the European level. If you wanted Europe to work, you'd need to bring in an institution like the US Treasury to enable those surpluses and deficits to be balanced out by fiscal flows. Now, that's not part of the European Union right now, but if you had the European Investment Bank being used in that fashion, then it could function in that way without needing political union. But given all that, um, America, the American dollar is a sensible currency. Europe, the, Euro, the euro is an insane currency. So I, I wouldn't want to... I would think ultimately I can't see the euro surviving unless they make the European Investment Bank the equivalent of the European, of Amer American Treasury. So the euro, I think, has got a very dicey future. What about the, the British pound compared to the, to the euro? Because well, the UK is part of the European Union. But it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the problem of not having its own treasury. So, yeah. uh, I mean, you, so England is... So will, will be the pound uh, safer, um, sounder, you know, more stable compared to euro I, I and the US dollar? And it's certainly sounder, whether it's safe is another story, because England, just as Romania has got a very small level of private debt and no particular issue with it, England has an enormous level of private debt, far higher than America, and far more volatility in that debt than America has. And you also have a government in England obsessed with running surpluses, which is the wrong thing to do. And America's running, Europe, England is running a huge balance of trade deficit as well, and balance of payments deficit. So for so the Romanian people, it's better to keep their saving in uh, in uh, national currency and avoid as much as possible to to um, yeah. pass the euro. No? Yeah. Well, I certainly wouldn't be I wouldn't be accumulating euro to keep my money safe as I'm in Romania. Uh -huh. If I was going to buy any international currency, I'd buy the dollar. But there was a great danger in buying in currency. It's it's, it's what Americans call a crapshoot. Ever heard that expression? Mm. Okay. Okay. It's a craps is a somebody who's obviously been to a casino. You know, you throw the dice. You hope you don't get what do they call it? The one and six uh, snake eyes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's it's a gamble. So, ultimately, I think the American dollar will be rising against the euro. <coughs> ultimately, I think the euro might fall apart at some point. Uh, but if they bring in the European Investment Bank, it might hold together and become quite a strong currency. England uh, certainly looks better than Europe right now. But if they go for austerity and that causes the economy to crash, then you could find the barrel of your pound falling. So there's so many factors. In, I, I, I'd avoid currency speculation like the plague. Another clever question coming from Anka there. Anka, what happened? Mm -hmm. So she's asking about uh, growth, you know. We discuss about what, uh, international growth mm -hmm. for uh, a better society. But uh, we saw China had a growth of 7, 80 percent, mm. you know, other people, other countries have one point something, mm. three point. Do you think it will be a figure like three, four, five percent as uh, the most appropriate uh, growth percentage to keep the world uh, stable? or? Uh, this up and down of each country could be more beneficial for... Uh I don't think it's beneficial. I think, I think we, we are in for... I mean, my, my work doesn't include the impact of uh, the ecology on economy because I know if I did, I'd swamp everything else I'm doing. But um, I'm just trying to find... Where that's are we? we are, we've been growing at far too high... A, uh, a rate for the, eco for, the, for the ecology for the last uh, 40 years, 50 years. 
So I just don't think our rate of growth is sustainable. We're far, we're far, far past sustainable growth. The slump we're going through now, I see, is being due to the dynamics of <coughs> debt, and not due to, um, not not due to um, secular seg- stagnation. The popular explanation that the mainstream economists, people like Bernanke and Summers, are using is to say there's secular stagnation, which I think is completely wrong. Okay, there's no actual cause right now, apart from a slowdown in, in population growth. And that's obviously at national level rather than international. That's causing a slowdown in growth in some countries. But overall, the two factors that cause growth are technical change and population growth. And in the aggregate, they're not, they're not stabling at all. What's slowing us down is the level of debt being so high, the level of in debt finance spending is lower than it would normally be, and debt finance spending largely finances investment. So there's less investment taking place. That's my explanation for the low growth now. But we are currently, according to a wonderful study called the Human Ecological Footprint, we are currently on an annual basis consuming, in a sustainable sense, 1.5 times the output of the planet. Now, there's no way we can grow from that growth point and reach this sort of level you're talking using three planets per annum. It's just not going to happen. So I think it's the ecological issue is the most important one we face, and in some ways we're distracted by the economy not to consider that. Both the IF, uh, Christine Lagarde, and the International Monetary Fund want growth before the growth and after the growth. Mm, yeah, something yeah. like that that is not uh, yeah. sustainable. Yeah, I mean, th- and one last question mm-hmm. I don't remember from whom yeah. is. Uh, Greece will remain in or will go out uh, of Europe? Well, yeah. Greece desperately wants to stay yeah. in the euro. Uh, that, that's, that's the, um, the argument. That this is, you know, Giannis is quite emphatic about this. That uh, He describes the um, European Union as a bit like the old, um, if you know the old movie, uh, a song by the Eagles, uh, Hotel California. You know that mm-hmm. song? Welcome to the Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Mm-hmm. Okay. He says, fundamentally, the euro should never have been formed, Greece should never have joined it, but once it's inside, it can't get out. Yeah. Okay. So he thinks it should continue. Um, I'm, I don't think that the German negotiators in particular realise how far they're pushing Greece, though, because at some point they could make it simply impossible for Greece to remain inside and force them out of the euro. And the way things are going right now, looking at the politics... I think that's at least a 50-50% chance that they'll force Greece out of the euro and then the euro will go through a, a cascade and collapse. But generally speaking, the euro shouldn't exist because it does exist. It should be managed well. It's being managed badly. Therefore, they should negotiate to improve it. They're negotiating to make it worse. So, you know. So we can have a question there. Yeah. La nivel internacional, mențin în scăzute dobânzile, atât la credit cât și la depozite. Uh-huh. Însă, populația nu le pune bani. Uh-huh. Păstrează bani în depozite acasă. Industria accesează credit, produce. Marca este pe stoc și consumul nu există. Uh-huh. Aceste cauze pot duce la 1930. Uh-huh. Now we are facing this. <laughs> we are facing a new situation nowadays. Mm-hmm. So um, the banks keep uh, the interest uh, rate for deposits and lo- uh, and loans very uh, 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 for deposits very low mm-hmm. for loans for loans very high so people don't go to low money mm. and they don't get uh, don't get too much money as uh, interest mm-hmm. you know there are another category of people keeping their money at home mm. you know uh, Industry has no possibility to get loans because mm. of high interest uh, rate. Mm. You know, consumers have no money to increase the consumption, mm. and uh, sometimes the government uh, take the passive 
way. Mm. Do you think such a situation can bring us in a similar in a, in a similar situation like in the uh, 1930s? It's because a sort of passive yeah. general approach yeah, of yeah. economy? Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely a danger. Definitely is a danger. And you, you want to have a... You, uh, you, you don't want any system to function well, especially a monetary system. So if you have this, this arrangement you're talking about there where people don't want to borrow money, keep it back at home, its rate of circulation is low, you're going to have a, a slow-functioning economy coming out of all that. So you do want to change the arrangement <laughs> so people are willing to keep their money in a bank, then that they don't take a risk in doing it, and that banks lend to finance businesses. That's what you essentially want, but not finance speculation on real estate and shares, which is what they've been doing in most of the West. So you, you do want to change that system. And that would actually involve changing the nature of banking in various ways. Uh, it has to be profitable for banks to lend to finance businesses, both for working capital and for investment. And at the moment, in many ways, it's not profitable for them. And it's also too expensive for firms to borrow from banks, so they're not willing to do it either. So what you get is a low rate of growth of debt, a low rate of circulation of money in the economy, and a low level of economic activity. So you do have to reform those elements of the society, definitely. Mm -hmm. <coughs> ah, Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin, I thought was uh, never going to be taken a, a serious, never be serious, until Cyprus. And then when you had the European Union telling people with bank accounts that they were actually gamblers and 40% of the money was above a certain amount was going to be taken out of their bank accounts, that was like the banking system blowing its own brains out. It was absolutely stupid. And it, meant it, it completely justified having a financial system which is independent of the state because only a banking sector which is beholden to the state can have the state say something is insane as we're going to take 40% of your deposits. So that legitimised things like Bitcoin and all the various um, uh, virtual currencies that are around the world right now. In a way, they wouldn't have been legitimate before that stupid, I can't emphasise the word stupid enough, decision <laughs> to do that to Cyprus. Who cares if it was Russian speculators? You don't touch deposits. The state does not steal deposits. Now that's in, criminals do that. Yeah? Criminals rob banks, not the state. Okay, bankers rob banks. If you know Bill Black, not 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 the state. So that was insane. That legitimised Bitcoin dramatically. The trouble about Bitcoin is two other things, or maybe three other things about it. First of all, it's been modelled on gold. The idea about Bitcoin is there's only 21 million bitcoins. You have to mine them. It's really hard to get them. Okay, and their value therefore rises compared to everything else. Except, first of all. How do you make gold? Anybody know how you manufacture gold? You get two neutron stars and you collide them, let them explode and splash the gold throughout the universe. It forms around a star and then aggregates into a planet after about three or four billion years. It's pretty hard to make gold. Okay? But Bitcoin, anybody can create an equivalent to Bitcoin just by developing a computer algorithm like Bitcoin. So there's numerous uh, artificial currencies now. Bitcoin's not the only one. I think there's about 30 that I've seen so far of different Bitcoin, start coins, something, dozens of different names out there, because mm -hmm. anybody can write an algorithm like that. The second problem with them is that how long do you think it takes for a Bitcoin transaction to occur? Mm -hmm. when, huh? I thought that too. Ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Ten minutes, because to verify the, the chain that makes it, uh, shows you've got an, a, a genuine Bitcoin and not a forgery, it's just a computer data, the process to evaluate that takes 10 minutes of high performance computing time. So to verify a check, a banking check, it takes from 45 to 60 days. No, so but nonetheless, uh, but you can go shopping with your credit, you can swipe a card and in two seconds you walk out of a, you know, the local fast food joint with a hamburger, yeah. okay? Bitcoin, you're going to wait 10 minutes for the hamburger? Now, what has actually happened is that there's other exchanges that do it where they take the risk that you might be using a forged Bitcoin. So that means it enables a transaction to occur more rapidly. It might take, say, 30 seconds in that case, which isn't so bad. But the computing power in every transaction is 10 minutes of high-performance computing time. That costs money. Okay? 
So that means that the energy costs of Bitcoin are far greater than the energy costs of the financial system we currently use, which is trivial. Okay? So I don't think it's a replacement that way. There are other currency systems that people are working on where you have a hierarchy of monies existing in different parallel communities where there's a central bank in each of those communities and they do the exchanges at the top level so you don't have that fear of, of forgery occurring at the lower levels. They may be more successful than Bitcoin in the long run, but certainly the idea of a, a form of currency independent of the state has been legitimised by the European Union's stupid decisions over Cyprus. So I think in general, virtual currencies and peer-to-peer -peer currencies may evolve in capitalism in the next 20 or 30 years, um, and that may change the nature of the monetary system quite dramatically. It still won't change the importance of debt. Thank you. Do you believe in the state influence and the indirect intervention for the benefit of the economy? Um, we live in a mixed economy. We have both both uh, private capitalist enterprises and uh, state system and community activities as well. And it, it's a complex system in that sense. It's, it's not just you know one type. So the whole obsession with the free market oriented mob of having a totally capitalist economy and the orientation of the old Soviet system of entirely state-based economy are both wrong. Okay? You need the combination of the two. You think of that yin-yang symbol from the... Okay? So the, the both are necessary and you have to then say what is... What are the functions of both? And to me, the sensible stuff for the state are things which are long-lived, assets which last a long, long time, and also behaving in a counter fashion to what the private sector does to get the balance. So if you have the state being responsible for sewerage, education, roads, uh, large-scale <laughs> elements like that, you don't want the private sector doing it. Because what does the private sector do? It makes a short-term profit and gets out before the pollution takes over the, the sewerage system. So you, you want to have long-term attitudes maintained by the state and you want investments that the private sector wouldn't consider because they won't make money out of them. For example, space exploration. If we look at what was being done by NASA to fight the Soviets over you know, getting Yuri Gagarin into, into the air, first of all, uh, the huge money wasted inverted commas and all that innovation but now, 40 years later, we have Elon Musk sending rockets into outer space at a profit. We have potential for space, tr space tourism being developed by Virgin Galactic. We have also attempts to bring meteor, um, meteors back into orbit above, asteroids into orbit above the Earth and mine them. Now, that's, they're, they're potentially going to be profitable capitalist enterprises, but they would never have been developed without the huge state investment, first of all. So you need a combination of the two. And I think if you want to look at the intelligent uh, discussion of what the role of the state and the private sector should be, there's two really good books that I recommend on this. One is by Mariana Mazzucuto, and it's... Um, I've forgotten the actual title, but The Entrepreneurial State, I think, is her argument. And she said the state is one of the two ways you can finance large scale of investment. So that's entrepreneurial loss-leading investment by the state that ultimately produces technologies which the private sector can make a profit out of. And the other side comes from Bill Janeway, and he's calling doing innovation in the capitalist economy, or doing capitalism in the innovation economy. I keep on getting it mixed up. And Bill's argument is you have to have it possible for people to believe you're going to make an enormous gain out of some investment. So if you look again at, um, at what Elon Musk is doing again with cars, a huge part of that enormous investment. Why? Because of a thought of enormous gain in the future. And private entrepreneurs need to be funded as well. So the state can do that large-scale loss-leading investments. Entrepreneurs tend to do stuff which can lose a large amount of money, but some are going to make an enormous amount of money, and you need both of them for a well-functioning capitalist economy. And the third book is Debunking Economics. <laughs> First time appeared in 2001. And uh, last year it was the last uh, the last edition, and nowadays it's translated not only uh, 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 in French, Chinese, Spanish, uh, Russian, 
And I hope somebody will translate it in Romanian uh, the book, yeah, thank you, Mother. And he was very kind to uh, to um, accept to send a few copies uh, for our uh, university library. To I will. Unfortunately, I, I, I got caught by the um, baggage limitations on Wizz Air and couldn't put yeah, it into my baggage, but I'll bring some over. Okay. So, um, so um, if there are not any more, there are any more questions? One more. Nu pot să mă ne dăm, pentru că internet e asta cu nu se poate ajunge pe lună, nu se pot să construi drumuri, școli. În 1908, în New York, nu exista impozit pe profit. Totuși, aveau drumuri, aveau pompieri, aveau poliție. How can you exp uh, how can you explain that uh, um, in 1908 in the United States there were no uh, in, uh, no uh, fees on incomes, but they had lot of roads and lot of uh, lot of uh, public. Uh, um, in the 19th century. Yes, yeah. in the 19th century. Yeah. Now we need the, we need the fiscal fees and the f uh, fees on incomes to build this. But at that time there were no, no fiscal fees. Well, there were no, there were no uh, income taxes, but there were certainly taxes on, on exports and imports that financed government expenditure. You had local taxes, etc., etc., financing local road building. A huge part of the... Uh, transportation of the states was railroads and that was totally capitalist driven enterprises initially I understand in America, certainly it was in England, so you can have this stuff being developed the, um, you didn't have uh, universal education you didn't have universal health care in the 19th century etc, etc uh, you didn't have universal sewerage either um, so you, you, it's something which um, is better done, I think, at a national level than done totally privately. Ro roads on, a, on an instant, uh, roads can be done on a local scale using local taxation, but you then get local road qualities coming out of that. You know, good quality roads in good areas, lousy roads in lousy areas. America has a form of privatised uh, taxation for its education system in that it's local taxes that pay for education. The result is if if you're born in a rich area, you have a good school. Born in a poor area, you have a poor school, which builds disadvantage right into the social fabric of America. I think it's a huge reason why America has the social conflicts that it has. If you had that at the national level, then you get an American education wherever you might be. And I think it's that lack of appreciation for giving equal opportunity that's a reason why you get the inequality and the crises America goes through on a regular basis. So that sort of thing, I would think it's as a social decision, it's far better to have that done at the national level than leaving it to private enterprise and therefore private advantage. Okay. So let's thank uh, Steve Kim for his presentation and uh, um, answer prompt answers to our uh, questions. So thank you very much. Steve.